Hey, thanks for joining us today, uh, David. We're going to look back at your time as uh, CEO at Telstra. Telstra was never new to investments in tech companies uh, through Telstra Research Labs and Telstra Ventures. Uh, the latest foray for Telstra, though, is via an accelerator program, Muru D. Uh, what drew Telstra to wanting to invest via an accelerator program, and, and why Muru D? Yeah, when you uh, look back uh, about why we went into Muru D, it is interesting. It was actually quite carefully crafted, uh, and there are a number of factors involved. Firstly, there's always been innovation in every industry, but what we saw more of was that with you know the digital enablement, you know connectivity, software development, AI, etc. That startups were suddenly you know really making enormous progress very very quickly because they're getting a global view that we hadn't seen before. We'd always had innov innovators and small businesses in our industry, but this was a whole different game. Secondly, we've done a lot of work on R&D and where R&D really fitted in the company. Remember, we had the Clayton Labs uh, many years ago. At Tulsa Research yeah, Labs. Tulsa yeah, Tulsa Research Labs. And, uh, and we were, you know, sold and closed them, but we weren't getting enough of the new thinking coming in. And the Ventures Group had given us a bit of that, but we weren't getting that really early stage thinking coming through. So that was a big consideration. And then thirdly, I felt very strongly that for the culture of the company, we had to be a part of this new way of thinking and, and being involved rather than sort of being on the perimeter uh, looking in. And that was what was happening. And so they were the three drivers. I mean, the fourth one obviously is to look to find really innovative ideas, I hope we make some money from as well. But those four were the, the reasons we said we're going to go with Mira D. And then, of course, Annie, <laughs> Annie turned up. Annie's fantastic. And she's, yeah. she's a powerhouse in herself. And, uh, and there was Charlotte Yoconi, and they came forward and we said, look, this just makes a lot of sense. But we were very clear about what we wanted to achieve. Are you aware of any early stage learnings in the process for Telstra? I think the early stage learnings have actually been more about this is great. I mean, actually, we've got more out of it than we expected. Uh, you know, the interactions have been really great. I mean, the way that our staff have really gone out of their way to be a part of it and have, has been really in, uh, encouraging. Look, I think there's been learnings in terms of the selection process about, you know, how you really put people through the you know, assessment process, um, you know, making sure that they've really uh, got something that can be commercialised or even if it's not, you know, uh, or creating some value, because sometimes it's not purely commercial, sometimes there may be a social or environmental impact, but being very clear about that, uh, I think we've learned things about you know the mentoring program and building a an ecosystem not that I really like that term but you oh, know really term, so yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. Um, but you know making sure that you're a part of the community of in the startup world and that you know getting all those relationships right I think there have been more the learnings than uh, anything from Telstra specifically we we've been absolutely delighted as someone who's had uh, experience with the startup sector for a number of years, and I don't like the term ecosystem either, um, what, what are the, the trends that you've seen change of, of late? There's more of them. What's <laughs> <laughs> my point? Uh, look, um, I think that there is a growing, you know, growing, this is in Australia, a growing recognition of just the value of what the startup community bring. Now, I, I should be clear, I do believe there's, that's always been there. Um, you know, that I think Australians and, I mean, people, but and Australia, are really creative people. I mean, they're always looking for, a, for an aspect, an angle to do something differently, which I really think is special. What, what I, I'm seeing now is this greater self-belief and recognition that we can do things you know, applying technology to great ideas and, and getting a different view of things and willing to take some risk and getting more support. I mean, obviously the innovation statements made a, a big difference and that's really great. And that's sort of giving an environment where people feel more confident to go and do things. Um, I'm seeing uh, also a little bit more selection about where people are going and where they're looking. I mean, because it's such a broad canvas of opportunity when you start looking at startups, and you would have mm -hmm. seen that from the number of people who come in. And I think we've got to be, well, I never want to constrain thinking. I think as a nation, we need to be clear about where we think we can really you know, make a stand and be really quite special. Okay, so now it's cool and sexy to be associated with the startup community. 
Um, what advice and or wisdom do you have for people looking to get involved and especially corporates looking to get closer to the startup sector? I would encourage corporates to think about it because I do think it's a very important part of the total mix of things you do. And as a company, you need to always be putting yourself out there and for opportunities to change, reinvent yourself. It's difficult, really hard. Uh, but if you do think about uh, getting into the startup and you know, in terms of uh, putting a little bit into accelerators, be clear about why you're doing it because you do need to, like any, anything you do, you need to be clear about what you're looking for as a return. Otherwise, it'll just be one of those nice projects that someone came up, it felt good, and then you wonder what happened when, you know, in two years' time, either it's not working or, you know, people are asking for money. Also look for what you're, you're trying to get out of it in terms of your own business. I mean, if you're going to have a broad brush approach to investment and startups, I'd probably say, is that really what you want to do? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got to be clear about what you're trying to get out of it as well and how you can engage staff. So it does take a lot of thinking. And I think, I mean, at Telstra, we went through quite a few iterations on that. Um, I mean, in some instances, we said, yeah, let's just give it a go. And that was fine, but that was a very low expectation. Others, we said, no, we really want to be very specific about uh, what sort of startups we're looking to support at this time. In January on startups, look, I'm a, one of those people, I, I, I get you know, value, energy, I get um, enthusiastic when I engage all those people, I just say, hey, give it a go, because it's great. I find yeah. I live vicariously through the people doing it, actually, it's fantastic, <laughs> you just get to stir great. them up. But whilst I hate silver bullet questions, are there one or two things we can do to grow more billion dollar companies in Australia? One is we do need to address this um, you know, self-belief question. Unfortunately, I think people think you know, too small in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, whether it's our geographical isolation, I don't know. But you know, even you ask people, how, what's the population of Indonesia? They really can't relate to it. So we've got to get people saying, yes, we can. And secondly, taking a global perspective. So David, you recently went on a trade mission to Israel. Uh, what stood out for you there? And what do you think we can adopt in Australia uh, from your Israeli experience? Well, look, the first thing that is, uh, you know, strikes you in Israel is that there's just this momentum and commitment that it's sort of the survival of Israel, uh, which is uniquely Israeli. Um, I mean, we're never going to quite emulate that, but we do need to get that impetus and belief uh, going in Australia, and I think that's happening. Um, look, the other thing that I would say in, in Israel is that, I mean, I, I, I didn't want to use the word ecosystem, but, but that collaboration between government, industry, academics, uh, research institutes is really powerful. And the one thing you go to Israel, I mean, it's very competitive, but if you go and talk to someone and say, hey, I'm working in some biotech area, and it's not there, so they say, hey, but I know somebody, and they do, and let me introduce you to them, and I'll get it going. And there's this sort of self-energizing that sort of it keeps going, and that's something we've got to work on. Because uh, as, you, as you get more mature in this area, I mean, you've got to know what you're good at doing, and, and you're not always going to have... Uh, the insights in there, and you've got to be able to have the ecosystem or the other people and say, hey, why don't we try this or go and talk to these people? So I was really impressed with that. Um, I mean, obviously, the government, uh, you know, support of the startup and innovation agenda has been really strong, but I think that's coming here in Australia, and, but it's up to us. You're now chairman of Australia's iconic research body, the CSIRO. There's been some changes uh, there. Larry Marshall is CEO, Adrian Turner in charge of Data61. Uh, given your experience, previous experience at Telstra and IBM before that, uh, what expertise do you think you can bring into, into this role from your previous corporate uh, background? <laughs> look, I really don't know. It's still early days. But um, look, I think what, what I can bring is, I mean, obviously I've been working in industry. I mean, my academic uh, connections are still developing. Um, and of course, obviously, I've worked in Canberra a lot and across the government. So there's, uh, I suppose I bring that perspective. But I hope that what I can bring is this, uh, this perspective and, and real desire to create something better for Australia, how we as a country can go forward, because that's really what drives me. What do you expect to be the challenges in commercialising the research in CSIRO? That's a tough question. Uh, it's undoubtedly 
the issue. I mean, it's sort of like the value of Despond because we get a lot of great ideas and great technology. Well, don't remember, it's not just technology, it's innovation in all its sort of uh, forms. And then how do we move it from that into something that is commercially viable? I mean, I would say firstly, I think we as a country got to say, hey, research and making money, that's okay. Mm. And I think sometimes, you know, the purity of research and not being sullied with uh, financial outcomes uh, has been more the predominant attitude. But it's good. If you get a great idea, you want to commercialise it. So uh, let's start with that view and try to you know, address the chasm. Obviously, there's been a lack of capital in moving people through that, uh, you know, through that stage and probably been impatient capital too, people yeah. not willing to stay the course. But that's the nature of the game and we've got to get familiar with that and we've got to get people who are used to working that through. We need people who are really good at taking early stage through to that next stage. Uh, and sometimes we're not good at doing that, so we want a bigger ecosystem, a bigger group of people. We've got to you know, have people who are familiar with that, and I think that's growing. Uh, and then we're going to have to take some risk. Got a, a couple of cheeky questions for you now, David. Um, do you think the next billion dollar success story will come from a CSRO research project? You know, I have no idea. Um, I, I would hope that even if it's not through traditional research, um, that somehow it doesn't matter as long as we somehow do it. Uh, and I think that's more... Look, I'm not... Look, research, you know, basic research is important, applied research is important, and purely random thinking. You know, I, I meet people who have been, never been involved in the academic research community who have got great ideas. So I'm not sure all that I want is those ideas be able to percolate up and us to be able to mature them to find out. Uh, and CSIRO's role is, is very clearly to be a catalyst, is to be an enabler. It's a government-funded organisation who does some great work, but it's got to do it in partnership with a wide group of partners, and it doesn't have to do everything. It just needs to help to create you know, all for the betterment of Australia. So that's what I would say. In my research for this, I noted that uh, Telstra Ventures had done very few investments where there was only research backing. Is that the case? There are a couple of that are in the research area. Well, when I would say the early stage technologies, there's one there, I think it's called Cahir, which is looking at spectrum, spectrum management. Yeah. Did you okay. see that one? Yes, that that would be the closest to still in, well, it's gone from research into a few uh, pilot, you know, beta testing. Um, but yeah, it's pretty. It's looking at applied technology of where we can really influence. I mean, it's, the, it's interesting looking at a, a corporate investing in, in, yeah. in technology yeah. and, and where that technology has its basis from. And yeah. all technology yeah. startups stand on the shoulders of giants. Yes, but, yeah, well, that's um, very true. It's moving it through an organisation like CSIRO yeah. is, is the challenge into a, an investment vehicle like Telstra Ventures, for example. Well, that that could well be the case. I I, I think there is a lot at uh, in within CSIRO that maybe it would be better off in different uh, you know, parts of that development, you know, research, um, startup community. And I think we're very open to that. In fact, I saw that Adrian is uh, about to now to hold the partnerships with you know, different accelerators around the country and for that yeah, very good. reason. I mean, if, look, the thing is about how we get this technology to make a difference to the world or business. And if it's getting bogged down, we've got to unleash it and let it go. You see, I'm a great believer in open openness. I mean, even when you think about it, and this is an aside you may not want to put in, but even when you think about research, I mean, we, we've got models that are, were designed, you know, 50, 60 years ago in research. I mean, so if you a, a, a got a PhD and you're applying for a grant to ARC, it, it's often based on the number of papers you're going to publish, not about outcomes. Now, if you think about research today in, a, in an open architected world, open data world, I mean, writing a paper is a bit foreign, really, because it's an iterative process, like mm, you and I would know with, you know with startups. You, you, you try something, you, you, you well, then you know, bounce ideas off people, and it's an iterative process, like you know, Google delivering new bits of software. So I think a lot of the ways we've approached uh, research and innovation are just not appropriate in today's world. And therefore, we've got to change the way we think about it. And so coming back, 
to your comment around um, some of these ideas. I mean, we've got to find ways to set up these alliances and collaboration uh, ways so we get to an outcome faster, not just you know, publish a document. But a disruption for research would be interesting, wouldn't well, it? Well, I mean, I actually think it's already happened, to be honest, and I think we're trying to catch up because um, you know, there's a lot of people out there. I mean, yes, IP is important. I'm not saying IP is not important, but how you get there is very, very different to the way we used to do it in our labs before. The federal government has recently released their innovation statement, as we've spoken about before, uh, which is great. We're a good few years ahead of us talking about the appropriate things. Uh, the startup community has owned large parts of that innovation statement. What's your definition of innovation and how does the startup sector fit inside that definition? Well, look, I'm delighted that the startup community got, you know, a really big, uh, you know, support and recognition. I think it was really important. But innovation is, is very broad. I mean, innovation is about attitude. It's about, you know, it's about how someone um, does something, you know, on the bus you know, how they drive their bus, you can be innovative. You can, it, innovation's not just startups, it's across all of society. It has social impact, environmental impact, financial impact, and it's about what you recognize as a community, as a nation. And what we want is people who question the status quo, who look for constant improvement, doing things better. Sometimes they're very small things, and sometimes they're very big. And we've got to teach it in our schools, uh, right from you know, people entering into you know, kindergarten all the way through in the university because it is, uh, it, you know, when you get that environment, people you know, by nature are creative people. I mean, we're all creative. In, and innovation comes out of that creative process. And that's what we've got to focus in on. Now, we do need you know, structures and frameworks to help, you know, you know, make sure money gets the right places. But innovation is broad, and that's why I think Malcolm is talking about being the you know, innovation nation, and I really support him in that. Yeah, it's an exciting time going forward. Thank, oh, you, very, thank you very much for that, David. Thank really you. Really appreciate your time.